So thank you very much. My name is Zainab Baroglu. I am a program specialist at, UN at UNESCO Communication Information Sector, and uh, I'm responsible for supporting the implementation of the OER recommendation. I will give you a very quick overview, and then we have a very packed schedule today. So um, go otherwise. This is not going well. So, as you know, this this is uh, this presentation is a, about the recommendation. So, what is UNESCO? I'll go very quickly. It's a specialized agency of the UN. It's based in Paris, and it has uh, it has offices all over the world, and it is part of the UN system. All our work is based on the UN documents, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and in that regard, of course, Article 19, which is about the right to receive and impart information and ideas through any media, regardless of frontiers, and of course, the right to education, and UNESCO's constitutional commitment to the free exchange of ideas and knowledge. So this, uh, this presentation, as you're aware, is about the UNESCO OER recommendation adopted two years ago. The recommendation you can find by going on our website, and it is one of about 15 recommendations. So recommendations are normative instruments which provide uh, recommendations on what uh, member states can do in one particular area and which they report on a regular basis. And uh, this one is particularly interesting because it's the only one on open educational resources in the whole UN system. And if there is a definition of what an OER is, and I think that's really important to keep in mind within the scope of what we're doing today, the definition is on the screen right now. It's the teaching, learning, research materials that are in the public domain or under a copyright that has been released under an open license. And an open license is a license that respects intellectual property rights and grants the public certain uh, permissions. This recommendation has a very large number of stakeholders that it addressed. It's not your typical group of educational stakeholders. It's much larger. It's, of course, the traditional educational stakeholders. Then we have libraries, archives, museums, publishers, of course, the public sector and private sector, intergovernmental organizations, media broadcasting companies, etc. It's all on your screen. So what's inside this recommendation? There are six basic action areas. As you'll see, there's a little blue uh, arrow, and the arrow points out that these different action areas function together. And as the OER global meeting has shown, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a very comprehensive recommendation, and the different parts of it work very closely together. The first one is about capacity building, basically the point that stakeholders understand the added value of OER, and they have the digital skills to create, access, reuse, redistribute OER, and that there are platforms that are available so that OER can be easily found. The second point is on quality, multilingual, inclusive OER. So that means that OER is available in languages other than English, because as we know, much of the internet is in English. They're accessible to persons with disability and other vulnerable groups, and they can also be available offline. Public investment is in, put into infrastructure for accessibility and that quality OER is compared or better than non-OER. And this includes the fact that it links to traditional OER quality assurance systems and other quality assurance systems. Sustainability, this is a big word, but basically if you want to, there are two main points that we want to underscore is that first that development maintenance and uh, is done where the end user doesn't shoulder the cost. So that means teachers and learners. And incentives for stakeholders to use OER are enhanced. So incentives for teachers, for institutions, etc. Policy. Uh, issues addressed in this section are procurement models to reflect uh, supporting open licensing, guidelines, standards, other guiding documents at national institutional level for OER. Incentives, again, for teachers can be addressed in this part also. And alignment with other open licensing policies, such as that for open data, open science, etc. Now, all over this, or surrounding this is international cooperation. So that there's international cooperation between regions, institutions, organizations, as a backbone to creating a means for which knowledge is shared globally in the framework of this recommendation. And this is about interinstitutional, regional, sectoral cooperation. This is basically the nuts and bolts of this document. 
I invite you, of course, to go and check out the specific uh, parts of the document, but just to provide you with a larger uh, perspective. What have we been up to? We've been very busy since this, uh, this uh, recommendation was was adopted and so has the rest of the world from the what's seen on the OER recommendation and from the OER OE global meeting which has been very very uh, very, very dynamic we have launched the OER dynamic coalition and this is a coalition of activities it's a means to support the different ongoing activities at UNESCO and within the framework of this we have done a number of activities we've had a series of webinars that look at different issues for example copyright capacity building policy we've had a mapping of the available online and offline courses we've looked we've revised the unesco guidelines for the inclusions of learners with disabilities with a look at um, emergency situations and it's in the framework of the unprpd the un partnership on rights with persons with disabilities we have a large project going on in in sahel which is um, through our UNESCO Dakar office on policy capacity building and francophone resources and other language resources, other languages in English. We have, um, we have done a developed a French version of a very important course that's been developed by the OER UNESCO OER chair in, in New Zealand that's on, um, on licensing, open licensing. And uh, we, uh, this is just an idea of some of the things that have happened since then. So there is, in, to go into today's discussion, we have, as you noticed, not just uh, the whole world has been through a pandemic since this recommendation was adopted. And in this light, UNESCO put out a joint call for, for uh, knowledge sharing through OER. And in this framework, we called that this was an opportunity for us to, for us as a global community, to build something new and um, to make it so that it, there's a foundation for systematically integrating open OER in the future of learning. And in this regard, we're going to be looking at three main questions today. And our, we have a very packed, uh, we have a very packed schedule, and we will be repeating these questions three times. And basically, we're talking about the fact that COVID-19 has been a trigger for renewed interest in OER. And this made the um, COVID crisis has repositioned the re recommendation, and it's an important starting for us, point for us in this discussion. And in some ways, the recommendation, in many ways, has become much more relevant. Higher education institutions and distance learning have taken a different and more enhanced role in learning and education than they'd had before this crisis. And it's important that we work together and share. Um, and share our experiences and see how we can move forward uh, to make a positive impact. But there has been some bottlenecks. The crisis has, just, has been a source of withdrawal and we have had an era in which sharing has been enhanced and also there has been, um, there has been other issues that have come up. Digital materials have been shared and there has been a second wave realization that it's not just sharing digital materials, but the importance of that they be openly licensed. That's very important for, uh, for development and for real knowledge creation. And the real, the potential and the uh, power of openness has become much more important. And the pandemic, pandemic has given us a learning moment, so it's important that we don't waste this very important opportunity. And in this slide, we will be looking at the three questions on the screen throughout the three panels. The discussions will be, uh, the first panel will look at capacity building and multilingualism. We'll have Dr. Jihan Osman, Dr. Jane Agbu, and Dr. Skander Ganya, and, and Dr. Micha Jamo, who will be speaking on this. And the second panel, we'll have uh, Dr. Lisa Petridis, Dr. Tella Neal, and Dr. Maria Soledad uh, Montoya. And the final panel, and they will look at policy, sustainability, accessibility, and quality. And the final panel will be on international cooperation, where we have Gaspar uh, Hastos from Slovenia, the national, he's the Secretary General of the National Commission. Neil Butcher from South Africa, from OER Africa, and Sanjay Mishra from the Commonwealth of Learning, who will also be looking at this. It's very packed, so I will stop very quickly, and we will have time for question and answer between the three panels. And with that, off we go. So I.
give the floor now to Jihan. I'm representing the point of view of higher education in Egypt and uh, the MENA region. And of course, I have, um, I cannot uh, say that I have like um, complete awareness, but of what I've heard and what I've interacted with as a member of um, that sector, um, that um, the, the, the impact uh, varied dramatically from one country to the other and from one sector uh, within the country to the other, uh, depending on multiple things. Um, and so um, the reaction in Egypt and a lot of the Arab world was not about the integration of OER or not, but how to continue and maintain education despite the pandemic. And um, and the question was, how do we integrate online learning and how do we reach um, all these students so um, that they can go on with their education? Um, in Egypt, um, there was not talk about open, uh, OE, about OER or not, but there was more about um, available and free uh, resources for students. And these were, um, developed through the Egyptian Knowledge Bank. Um, very few universities um, um, integrated OERs, um, uh, mostly uh, in Lebanon. Um, so the, the issue was more about, um, there was definitely a lot of um, weak, uh, like inequality issues and accessibility issues for refugees, for uh, poorer sectors of society, for residents of rural areas, for girls. But these were not a matter of OER or not, or having materials or not, but uh, they were more at the basic uh, need of internet or not, and um, computers uh, or not. And, um, and so, uh, so for many, uh, just having internet at home was considered a luxury and as such many students in higher education around uh, the Arab world could not continue with that education during the pandemic. Um, and I'll let my colleagues um, talk further about um, the situation in their parts of the world. Skander, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Skander Galia. I'm the Director General of uh, Digital Affairs at the Ministry of Education in Tunisia. And it's my pleasure to share with you our experiences of this situation as they relate to the pandemic on the one hand, and on the other hand, how they relate to the development of open educational resources. When we discussed this issue in 2019, we thought that we were only facing this issue in terms of digital resources. But unfortunately, with the pandemic, we've learned that there are other issues that relate to the situation of Tunisia, but also the rest of the world. And mainly in terms of infrastructure and access to that infrastructure. which varies greatly depending on the regions. So you could say that there's not equal opportunities in different countries and in different areas of Tunisia, not just in terms of accessibility, but also in terms of competency development for teachers, because we're facing a situation where teachers are asked to teach using digital materials but there are great variations in terms of the teacher's skills and how they can adapt to this situation. What's most important is to highlight that even if technology is used and available for some persons, learning models are not necessarily adapted. There's not a clear model when it comes to the use of these learning systems. And this brings us to resources, because even if there are resources, even if there are resources available, are they suited to 
the user population. There's a great variability in terms of these resources. They're not always capitalized on. They're used in a specific uh, channel, for example, on websites, but this isn't always available in rural areas. So as you can see, there are a number of issues here. The pandemic is an opportunity and it has allowed us to see the gaps that we have in terms of digital learning models, for example, and in international conferences. I was able to participate, to participate in some conferences where it was said that we don't have a clear model in terms of integrating these learning models in the digital context. So with this pandemic, we've had an opportunity, although of course there are also issues that the pandemic has brought about, it's an opportunity to restructure and reposition our digital and digital development strategy in the field of learning and teaching. Now, when it comes to digital resources, despite the lack of digital resources and the lack of a clear strategy in terms of the development of digital resources in Tunisia, We've been trying to share a regional strategy with UNESCO to strengthen the use of open resources so that we can move forward globally and regionally. But what we've noticed in Tunisia is that these resources are not necessarily always available. So we've had to try to create linkages and to create a single a portal for access to these resources. So that's what we've been trying to do, to bring together all of the resources that are available, to have them certifi certified by uh, teaching inspectors, but also to allow teachers to share these resources with a specific uh, model. But the problem that we have now is that we need a clear strategy for the development of these resources and we need to harmonize the development of these resources as well. Now, secondly, we always talk about resources available on the internet, but internet isn't always accessible to everyone. And what we've seen in Tunisia, what we've done is to launch an educational TV program, which is an interactive program and covers all education cycles, uh, secondary school, uh, high, high school and higher education. In Tunisia, there are around 11.5 million inhabitants and in education, in the three cycles, there are around 2.3 million students at all of these levels and there were around 150,000 teachers in primary and secondary school and around 6,130 schools uh, primary secondary and higher education so we launched this school tv initiative but we started with a pilot framework in order to make these resources available. Now I say this because when it comes to the third question, you've asked about solutions and innovations, we need to take into account the various channels that can be used to make these resources available, including uh, the TV channel. But what's important to remember is that when it comes to pedagogical material, uh, 
it's something that requires a lot of work if we want to develop digital resources. And I believe that UNESCO is the right uh, platform to advance and move towards the development of these resources. Now, I'm talking about teachers and uh, educators who need to be prepared and trained for digital transformation as well as digital production and uh, open resources. I'll stop here and give the floor to my colleagues. Thank you. There are many things which are getting um, into the direction of mainstreaming OER. So in particular, so if I'm speaking about Slovenia and Europe, so the main issue about the accessibility to OER and how to, uh, how to make them available and usable is being discussed here around quite a lot. There were several projects to be supported by the European Commission in the previous calls. Um, uh, so several have been successful, of course, several not as well. But certainly this is something which is a key point. So the key point is that whenever you talk to anyone, um, in particular teachers or content creators, you will have the same the same response which would be you know it's very difficult to find and it's very difficult to use and it's very difficult to implement oer and we would like to have something which would be a pragmatic simple usable user-friendly solution and this is why things are being developed at our end so we uh, for example consortia of partners that we have been involved with just finished one of the one of the projects which was called x5 gone and i can share then later on um, some of the stuff that we did and so if you go to the to the site you will find out several tools for this cross-lingual recommendation oer use analytics uh, discovery so we collected we are automatically collecting oers and we are having right now more than half a million of oer uh, materials, collected materials, uh, um, not just collected, but also on uh, also uh, process it in a way that you can use that in various forms. In particular, that would mean uh, also multilinguality, so that we take care about the automatic translation of those. And uh, and of course, the the idea and the the tools that are there to be used to uh, essentially become a, a website, becoming a part of the global OER network to support this cross recommendation and uh, one point of view. So those are the things that certainly are being done. There are many other things as well. So uh, as you can understand uh, from, the, uh, from the research and development in the area, so uh, for example, the multilinguality or let's say automatic translation is getting better every day. And that would include various types of modalities, so not just text, but also spoken world and um, and um, and the uh, uh, videos, which essentially is something that is being used very hardly today. Uh, so uh, there is this is one part of it. So the technical development, uh, the other part which is still missing is OER development in the sense that the people will really develop OERs and proclaim that uh, them as an OER with appropriate license. Still a lot of works have, been, have to be done there. So there are many initi initiatives here in, in Europe that actually goes into that direction to promote OER to the teachers community in particular, and then also to, to the community of uh, TVET, so, uh, so the lifelong learning part. So there is a lot of work uh, still to be done, but things are getting better and that's because mainly because of now of this new reality that uh, you know we never know when and how uh, we will switch to we have to switch to online education and this is something that uh, as it in the first wave and the second wave in most cases countries will actually just just solve issues on the spot without any strategic uh, directions and this is why now the Europe is going into that, looking at more strategic directions. Then uh, there is quite a lot of discussion on, in particular, on using AI in education. And so we are involved in, of course, with the UNESCO, in particular in the new recommendation on ethics in AI. And then there is quite a lot of work on EU level. So there is a 
specific strategic group now discussing about how AI should be looked at as a tool, a set of tools that can be used in education. And then uh, there is pl plenty of work in the Council of Europe. Council of Europe is an international organization that out of those is the only one that actually can provide something which is a uh, legislative document that that has to be used by by all the member states and there is a quite a lot of work on OECD as well and particularly in the sense of how the technology can support the uh, open education um, as i say as i said so many national ecosystems uh, education ecosystems are now aware of oer so as I'm, I'm talking about europe eu so it's aware about the OER, aware about the, uh, the, the positive and negative elements of OER. And, um, and they are trying to push their, their investments into that. Uh, some countries are doing that better, some countries are doing not that better. But certainly this is something which is a distinction between before COVID and now, let's say, after COVID period. Why it's still more relevant today, certainly because of the things that I already said. So in particular, because we need to find out solutions to support national educational ecosystems with uh, access, open access to, to open educational resources. Now, on one side, this is related to, uh, uh, to promote OER for the better understanding of OER. And on the other side, uh, there is a need which goes a little bit beyond what is the current education, which is about the flexible and pragmatic learning scenarios, which are also including the, the CVET, as I said already before. Now, problems which are there, as I said, so is still, is still missing the usable and user-friendly platform and tools. The one we developed is there, so and this is automatic, so that would mean that uh, we provide to anyone access to uh, to this processing platform through various APIs and various tools that we developed, and everything is completely free. Uh, the multilinguality is uh, adding every day, so um, that would mean that more and more languages are being involved uh, into that, and this is a very good sign for the for also not just multilingual but also multicultural. OER's uh, personalization of learning is being discussed in relation to access to private and personal data. So some of the ideas are there. Europe is quite uh, quite strict in that response. So following GDPR now is the GDPR 2.0 being, being developed. So things that are getting in the direction of um, uh, uh, creating the, the all necessary measures to to uh, for for uh, for uh, private and personal data, and then uh, there is a lot of discuss about the access and use of this data. So it's not just about how to prevent, but also how can we gain, or how the system, or how the education can gain from this information and this data. So all in all, it's different, certainly because of uh, the the lessons learned that we had recently. Uh, it's different because Europe is certainly trying to get into this multicultural environment so trying to open education following everything that we did so far on the Bologna reform and uh, and all the other stuff and um, uh, so certainly Europe is looking at for expanding these ideas and these models to other countries as well so that will be briefly uh, about what the status here uh, as I said I'm pretty much positive uh, because I see that there is uh, not just a, you know, uh, something that would be a good idea, but it's also a need now from the education environment to get into OER and open education. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Micha. Thank you. I think we've had a very rich discussion. We've seen that, um, in fact, uh, Micha has shown the different developments. So the field of OER has become very sophisticated. It's become very, um, the EU in the EU, it's very highly developed. AI is being introduced. Skander pointed out that while there were bottlenecks in getting resources up and getting things going, it has been solved. There is a solutions that have been put in place in Tunisia. Um, Jihan pointed out, of course, that 
in fact, connectivity just by itself is a very big issue and was something that needed to be addressed and was uh, extremely challenging at the beginning. We have three questions uh, on the line. Um, I can answer the first one very quickly, then I'll give the floor to Skander and to Mitya, to whom they're addressed. The first question was the 200, 2012 declaration paved the way for the recommendation. Yes, it did. Um, the, we had two world congresses, the first one in 2012. The 2012, the main point of the 2012 declaration was that um, uh, repaying for publicly, uh, OE, educational resources made with public funds should be made available on an open license. That was a cornerstone of the recommendation and remained in the Ljubljana OER declaration, which was used as the structure actually was the main was the basis of the discussion of the current recommendation and it was also um, maintained into the recommendation so the answer is yes skander je vous donne la parole très vite pour la if you'd like to take the floor to address the question that is up in the chat on the translation Yes, the question was a translation of uh, free resources available into other languages uh, and whether it means that it can uh, sort of reduce uh, the need for other and new resources and the answer is sort of yes and no. Uh, of course, if we have a standard reference model, then having resources available can be translated in whatever language, French or another one, and can lead to proper use, and it means uh, less need to develop these new resources. But look, for instance, at uh, resources as actual lessons, okay, teaching lessons. Well, you know that these uh, need to be to comply with very specific technical and educational standards and there are a number of resources that can't be uh, accepted by educators because of their constraints yes these resources might uh, convey something that is required but if it's not in the right kind of format it won't be acceptable or usable by um, educators so sometimes within a, a given country or even within a same a given discipline amongst teachers who teach the same kind of thing they um, might not always accept the resource or agree to use it as it stands now in tunisia and i'm sure it's the same in other countries there are uh, there's the inspectorate of schools that sets the, ped the, the pedagogy that needs to be used, and I'm sure that's true in other places too. So, to answer your que to the question, I'd say that if the resource actually uh, corresponds to the model set for a given place, then it can be simply translated, but in other instances, uh, that is not necessarily the case. And in uh, Tunisia, for instance, there are a number of resources that are not uh, certified by the inspectors, in, even though uh, they've been devised and uh, set up by teachers themselves. Thank you, Eskander. Alexander says in uh, the chat that it's an issue of adaptation. So it's adoption versus adaptation. The question is on interoperability. So Zena, that was for me, right? Yes, the last one. Can, can you can you reply? Can you can you repeat, please? For Mitya, is interoperability still an issue in the diverse types of resources we adopt and adapt? So many OERs in closed formats. No, so so the, the thing that I, I've explained a bit, so uh, this automatic content gathering and processing, this is actually being solved automatically. So there are tools and capacities and technologies that can do that. So interoperability is not an issue anymore. 
of course, for some some special special aspects could be, but essentially it's for the things that are there mostly widely used, this is not the case anymore. So that can be solved technically. Okay, thank you very much. I think we're right on time. So I will thank this panelists for this uh, for their very important uh, interventions and give the floor now to the second panel which is on policy sustainability accessibility and quality and uh, with panelist uh, lisa you have the floor great thank you very much well i want to talk about sustainability and what the recommendation initially set out was to really encourage a, a comprehensive and integrated sustainability model so this was going to be looking at uh, procurement models by institutions and governments uh, how we could catalyze new models for funding and how we could build capacity uh, across the silos of government and institutions to really su uh, support continuous improvement and, and OER itself as, as a sustainability model. Um, what I think we've really seen and what's been different with COVID is that uh, really it moves so it, it really moves past this idea just that economics is the main model around sustainability and, and that's what we focus on in other words the money uh, and the funding that is brought in. Certainly it's important, but I think where it's come in is different and that it's much more around creating communities of uh, practice and the professional development, uh, issues around accessibility and translation. So it's really what we're seeing is it's more about, um, so, so sustainability is really about developing the capacity of people. And I think that's what we've seen here now uh, during COVID and the pandemic, uh, whether it's for training or awareness building or collaboration, um, uh, it stipends for educators to actually do this work. Um, so these um, recovery efforts are not just about uh, OER or carrying the flag for OER. It's really saying where can the use, the adoption and the ad adaptation of OER be built into the existing uh, mechanisms around education. Now, really specifically, I, I think some interesting things we've seen um, here in the US is that those uh, who were using OER already had a much easier time adapting, not only because the resources were already digital, but because they already had a certain kind of mindset that they were thinking about how you adopt, a, uh, uh, I mean, how you adapt a resource. What is it that a specific learner needs? How can I align that to standards? Those are the kinds of um, questions that when you are um, adopting OER that you're thinking about very different than if you're just using the standard textbook that's been used for 10 years and you keep using it. You're really thinking about, um, about the student and what their learning needs are. So uh, in some ways, I think with COVID, the emphasis has now gone back to kind of the professionalism of the educator as being the expert who, who knows best about learning, who knows best about what it is a student needs, how to accelerate that student learning. Um, and I wanna also just talk about some of the pieces that uh, have really come in around um, equity and inclusion and accessibility as well. Um, you know, accessibility is something that we think uh, a lot about and has come right to the center, I think, around OER. And when we think about accessibility, we think about uh, can a person with a disability, do they have the opportunity to uh, acquire the same information? Can they engage with the material in the same way? Um, can they really enjoy what it is that that service or, or resource has um, just as much as a person without a disability? I think if we think about OER accessibility, you know, it really is about uh, multiple options for learners. It's, um, are the uh, materials perceivable? Are they usable? Are they understandable? And, and this is really what, if you've heard of this term of UDL or um, universal design for learning, um, it's about having uh, flexible options to, to understand the material, 
um, and to express how we learn and, uh, and, and what we know. These are really, I think, some of the pieces that uh, we're seeing post-COVID people are looking at much more specifically. Um, I wanted to invite also Marisol to uh, speak a bit about the example of, um, again, I'm going to say this is where we're not just looking at procurement, but the examples of um, being able to build with a community practice that really transcend and build on the original um, initiatives. And Marisol, are you there? And if you Thank are. Thank you. Marisol. Marisol, if you like, you can speak in Spanish. We have, um, we have interpretation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. I'm going to check for, for the Spanish. Uh, okay. En, en, esta, en este tema que nos ha manifestado Lisa sobre la sostenibilidad. The topic that we're talking about, the one that uh, Lisa is talking about in terms of sustainability, is a film which much has already been done, but there's still a lot to do. I mean, uh, of course, there are many uh, initiatives that have been taken on OER and open education. And let me give a few examples, for instance. A recent um, major project conducted in Mexico uh, involved three uh, contributors, uh, uh, the private sector, the government, and uh, the universities and we were working on something that was well, really tailored to uh, the needs of Mexico. Now a number of um, things were done, namely amongst other things, one relating to the use of OER in the context of MOOCs and we had also to look at, for instance, uh, um, training on uh, the um, energy sector. We had 12 modules with 1,200 um, OER resources available. There are two sets of uh, resources, if you will. One is an open library. And you could, in a way, access um, this information, or we did things in two different ways. First of all, there were 12, as I said, um, MOOCs with a specific courses, workshop, workshops, uh, master's courses, that relied on these uh, 12, uh, 1200 OER. And on the other hand, there was activities that were um, there to enable us to identify new projects, new resources, uh, to try and set up innovation networks within education. That's uh, one of the things I could, uh, I was willing to mention as concerns uh, concrete examples relating to sustainable development. Now, a number of questions have been asked and we wanted to share them with you relating to this specific topic. First of all, in what other parts of the education system, government, institutional or otherwise, is existing work taking place in which the creation, adoption and adaptation of OER could be embedded? And the second question was, how can you ensure that the costs, local and or regional, in terms of adoption and adaptation, are not necessarily borne by the teachers and or educators and learners? So those are the two questions we might want to look at. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marisol. Could I give the floor to tell? Um, to Tell Emil, Dr. Emil. So good afternoon, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, we, we had a small deck of slides, which I won't be able to show now, and just a couple of them, but I'll, I'll speak instead following what the colleagues have done. 
And uh, what, uh, what we're discussing uh, in terms of policy, uh, we highlighted some uh, elements which we thought we were particularly useful uh, in the recommendation is that the recommendation uh, today is more relevant than ever because it expands beyond uh, the discussions on open licenses. So of course, it, it provides a definition of what an OER is and it discusses permissions, but it goes way beyond that. And I think it's a very important point to think about OER beyond just the idea of open licenses. It also does a, a really good job of uh, expanding our notion of, of policymaking beyond just large scale national uh, implementations. So of course we do need uh, top down uh, implementations and large frameworks that can help us move forward in terms of policy, but it has put, I think, a, a more uh, reasonable emphasis on uh, the, uh, the actions of you know, bottom-up designs and bottom-up top-down concomitant designs where we have a lot of institutions and small organizations and, and even at the larger government levels at smaller sections of the government where we're making changes uh, that can impact in, in a large scale instead of uh, I think what we did in the beginning which was to focus on very big large national policies and we found that to be fairly hard to do. Um, so that entailed, I think, uh, one, of the, one of the things that's, that's present on the recommendation is this idea that we need to engage people from all sectors in designing policy. It is not something that we do to other people, it's something that we do together with other people. And I think across the world, when we do you know, surveys of policies and we have maps of policies, we can, we can see that a lot of the initiatives, either at the discussion or the implementation level, have happened at states, smaller institutions, and then as slowly as they build, they get large organizations and the national uh, you know, temperature around OER to, to grow. Uh, and finally, I think what the recommendation does today, which is, is even more relevant, is that we're thinking about it systemically. And I think this is an incipient point, but a very important one, is that uh, we're starting to think about OER policy together with other policies. So instead of just trying to come up with a single policy that's just around OER, I think what the recommendation does and is very urgent today is to think about how we align uh, OER policy with other types of policies. So uh, engaging with ICT policy, uh, open access policy, which many countries do have at a large scale or states have at a large scale. Uh, engaging OER within those frameworks makes it a lot easier to, to have policy uh, come around. So. Um, in order to give uh, an example of this uh, as, as something that would be, you know, uh, uh, to contextualize what we're discussing here, well, one of the examples that we have is we recently, just last month, uh, worked with the state of Sao Paulo, and it's a it's a huge state with more than 5,000 schools and three and a half million students, uh, which is kind of the size of Uruguay, just in terms of students. And we worked with the state of Sao Paulo to develop policy which was approved last month, an OER, specific OER policy that mandates that all uh, materials created by the state of Sao Paulo's school, Secretariat of Education have to be an open educational resource. But in order to do that, uh, we did a lot of workshops with folks from, you know, from teachers and managers, administrators. We played what we have, uh, and it's called the open policy game, which has been used in many parts of the world. It's a, it's a policy game that gets people engaged over a period of you know, four to six hours to think about uh, the technical aspects, the pedagogical aspects, and the legal aspects, and we map out the challenges. And then we go uh, about designing policy based on the local needs and the assessment of the, of the local population. It's a long-term process that starts with tools like this to get people engaged from the beginning. And uh, the policy itself becomes, of course, very important, but it also helps us think, because we're thinking systemically, to get us uh, to get these actors as, as you know as uh, really engaged in the process as they move forward. So when when we change people's minds about uh, about OER and we get them engaged, the chance that the policy will survive is much uh, much higher than just getting a document approved. And I think we've seen a lot of these examples over the years uh, of getting large policy projects, including us here in Brazil, that uh, ultimately don't get things moving forward because uh, we don't have actors engaged. In this process, so getting getting people to buy in, I think, as Lisa was saying, for sustainability is incredibly important, but also for the sustainability of policies as well. And so, to finalize, uh, we had a couple of questions we wanted to put out, which I think would be useful for for other folks. So, questions based on, in a sense, of this reflection that we did in our group, which is, 
what are, uh, in what ways can we think of these large national policies as, as policies that we can leverage to create smaller OER-oriented policies? So when we look at the, when we start to, to think about OER policies, what can we look at at the national landscape that could support us rather than trying to think about creating necessarily an OER policy from scratch? So is there an ICT policy that could, could be leveraged? Is it an open access policy or an, a willingness to work with open access or, or open source software? What, what is there already in place that we can leverage to create and support the idea of OER policy? And of course, the OER recommendation itself is, is such a, a policy in a sense. You know, we can look at the OER recommendation at, at uh, different sectors of government and say, this is something that we could use as, as a supporting document. And finally, uh, just to finalize, another example is uh, for institutions, particularly uh, in higher education institutions, to what degree can you look at peers to see what other peers are doing to leverage uh, OER policy in your institution. And I'll give one example that relates related to, to the COVID pandemic, uh, which is in Brazil, a lot of institutions didn't have a copyright policy, and most of them still don't, not an official copyright policy. And when we moved online and we had to put our videos online and all our materials online, teachers panicked, administrators panicked, students panicked. And we started a movement here in Brazil where we had this template from one institution that was approved by, by the set of that institution. And we basically remixed that policy to three and four other institutions that adopted that same copyright policy during the pandemic. And so instead of starting from scratch in the spirit of OER, what we did is we got a policy that was approved somewhere else. We tweaked it to get it adopted and, and, and planted in other institutions so that others could speedily and quickly in the spirit again of OER, to get this done and get their policies in place during the pandemic and solve this uh, very immediate problem. So I'll stop with that and I'll send it back to you, saying it and to my colleagues if they want to comment. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Tel. Um, thank you. That's really very good. Uh, would you mind, um, Tel? Would you mind putting those questions into the chat? I think they're yeah, very. Pertinent. Yeah, we we just put both sets of questions. I want to just thank draw you. a bridge between the policy question and the sustainability question. Uh, what Tel had just said is, what are the larger policies in in your country that you could leverage to begin with your institutional policies? Um, and similar around sustainability, you know, thinking about what other parts of the education system um, in existing work, where existing work is taking place, that this creation and adoption of OER could be embedded as a sustainability uh, model. So I think we're, at, we're sort of asking the same question, one from the sustainability point of view and one from the policy point of view, is this question of where do you embed into existing um, efforts that are taking place, uh, whether it's around ICT or open source, um, the remaking of libraries. These are, I think, where we're seeing this um, sort of the advent of the impact of COVID and the pandemic, realizing that we can't just simply carry um, the banner for OER, that it has to be fully integrated into the existing education system policies and practices. Yes, indeed. I think we're coming back to the concept of mainstreaming. It can't just stand out alone because it's too, it's too complicated now. It's too big, and there's a lot of with the pandemic, we've had a lot of different um, initiatives that are in the same areas that really could be reinforced if they're together. Um, with that, I'd like to give the floor to Jane. Jane Akpo from Nigeria. Are you there, Jane? You were here. Um, let me see, Jane. Let's see. I think we lost Jane. Jane, are you there? I think you're here. Yes, the floor is yours, Jane, to give the. Are you able to get on, Jane? Okay. Um, while we see if Jane is able to get on, could we go to the questions, perhaps, and just. Um, see if we can open the floor very briefly. We have quite a bit of time. Um, and the questions are actually in the discussion on this one, but I'll just read them out. Uh, the first question was that, uh, what larger policies in your country can leverage to begin 
can you leverage to begin your institutional policies? What institutions that are similar to yours that you can reach out for examples of strategies? Has this been an experience that other people in the discussion have, have had? No? Uh, no, okay. Um, the second question. Uh, si me permiten? Yes, yes, please. If you'll allow me. Well, I'd like to share an experience with you. In Latin American countries, there are only four or five countries that have a national policy in terms of open access, which require that all projects with public funding produce articles, uh, patents, and products that are open educational resources or in open access. So these policies that exist in these Latin American countries allow educational institutions, particularly higher education institutions, to mobilize open access actions and this has brought about an increase in open repositories which gather scientific knowledge of institutions and make it accessible. So these national policies have enabled other policies to generate open access infrastructure which enables that mobilization. And as was mentioned, there's still a lot to be done in this field because these policies aren't always supported, whether at national or institutional level, with a follow-up on what's happening in terms of the implementation of these resources. And to date, there are no incentive systems to uh, incentivize and encourage this open access work and research. So there's still a lot to be done in this field in order to create linkages with the elements that have previously been mentioned in terms of policy and sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Lisa, would you, would you like to add anything on this point? Um. Uh, were you going to actually have Jane come in? I wasn't sure. I was trying to get Jane to come in, but there seems to be a hiccup. So if you'd like to take the time to uh, provide some background to the ideas that were put forward, that first of policies which can leverage other policies and also the, uh, the other point that was made by uh, templates and uh, remixing of policy. Yeah, I think that... Um, well, there's, there's two pieces of that. I think um, looking at the ways in which uh, sustainability is being um, bolstered by not only additional funding that, um, that is coming in through the reallocation of resources. So not on the, for the purchase and the, the purchasing and the cost of materials, but again, really emphasizing the where uh, the people need to be supported. And that's mostly with training, that's with the, the creation of libraries and repositories. Um, it's uh, looking at where there might be accessibility or diversity and equity initiatives, where OER can be brought into um, those areas. So those are how I think both at the governmental level as well as institutions, those are some of the places where um, existing work really can be, uh, can be leveraged. Uh, and somebody wrote also about the crossing the silos uh, of open. And I think, uh, while I don't think that has ever been actively discouraged, 
uh, I think really looking at the at what is open access, what is open data, open research, open resources, we are finally at that point where we really can look at these kinds of efforts and uh, cooperation, uh, not just across institutions, but across countries is really going to bring us uh, the biggest benefit. And I know that there'll be a conversation around this in terms of international cooperation. But when we talk about not only sustainability, but about policies, I think this is where we're going to see um, significant changes. Thank you, Lisa. I think you're bringing up another point that is through the, um, through the last, uh, through this pandemic period, online has become uh, mainstream, mainstream, and that has brought together the openness issues. And we even have, um, um, we even have right now another recommendation that's on open science and open science has become another issue with the pandemic. So I think we're seeing a sort of snowball effect here and it's, it's a good thing, and it's a, but it's also a complicated issue. Anyway, I am very happy now that we've got Jane online and in front of us and on screen and with the micro. So I give the floor to Jane, Jane Francis from uh, Na National Open University in Nigeria. Please go ahead. Thank you, Zeynep. I hope you can hear me. I, I'm sorry, I, I was having technical issues. In your opening remark, you noted that the pandemic has given us a learning moment. So we don't, we need to leverage on that and uh, don't waste this opportunity. And uh, I'm actually was supposed to talk on capacity building, right? The pan first panel. So I want to start by saying that uh, everybody, the institutions and the government all have the consensus that uh, the consensus of many insti uh, of institutions and the government is that everyone has the right to education. And the, the, this pandemic, with this pandemic, there's an urgent need for government to be made aware of the prayer of UNESCO recommendation, which is also very dear to my heart, coming from the developing world encourage the open licensing of educational materials produced with government funds. We need to increase uh, uh, advocacy, targeted advocacy in this area, specifically for the ministers of education and so on, because we need to help unlock, this will help us to unlock knowledge for the benefit of all, okay. And uh, also the new normal has increased the utilization of ICT in teaching and learning and both digital immigrants and, na and natives are left with no choice but to adjust to this new normal. And it requires significant time spent online searching for teaching materials. This presents a good opportunity to learn how to access to create, share, integrate OER in teaching and learning and a good example is a, what UNESCO is bringing uh, brought on board, the ICT competency framework harnessing OER for teaching and learning is a very good initiative. Why uh, the recommendation still relevant? It gives us the opportunity to encourage uh, embedding OER policy into our national uh, frameworks. We don't need to go on uh, coming up with something elaborate. All we need to do is to understand, appreciate the beauty of open educational resources and embed, embed that in uh, our national policies. We have bottlenecks. People are still unaware of open educational resources, especially from my own end of the world. And also we have what we call the approach avoidance conflict associated with, associated with embracing open educational resources, which could be triggered by poor insight in this area. So more capacity building is needed here and also misperceptions. Find, sometimes you find OER champions, they find themselves walking a lonely path because of these misperceptions about open educational resources and also fear about um, sharing knowledge and also uh, opening up their content, fear of scrutiny and so on. So we all need to be open-minded. We have technology challenges, we have a low political will and uh, I keep mentioning capacity building is still low solutions innovations from my own end uh, regional and global uh, collaboration is needed for example unesco collaborated with my institution in 2014 to champion the establishment of an oer uh, unit in my institution we also need a capacity building as some of the innovations and solutions to build awareness 
to understand developing and integrating OERs in teaching and learning, uh, also to uh, and also take note of converting them uh, and also developing OERs in local languages and the leverage on open license tools and the nurture OER resources. And also very important is to promote digital literacy skills. Another solution we need to look at is to nurture OER champions. Like I said earlier, we are actually very lonely when we are championing this uh, initiative. So we need a little bit of understanding and nurturing and encouragement in order to, to keep doing the work. For example, in my institutions, uh, I had to, uh, on every Wednesday, we have advocacy day. So in my institutions, we usually, we designed an OER t-shirt, which we put on to work every Wednesday and people come around to understand, to, to, to share and to try to learn from us and try to understand what open educational resources is all about. And another, lastly, another in, in innovation, which is worth mentioning, is uh, online courses on integrating OER in teaching and learning. There is a common way of learning uh, MOOC ongoing now. Uh, my institution has also leveraged on that to use the OER content to design our MOOC that will is actually starting on the 4th of October. And as we speak, we have, we have about 2,100 2, participants ready to start the MOOC already. So these are some of the innovations, solutions, and the way forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jane. Thank you very much. I think it touched me that you said it's, it's sometimes a very lonely job and it's hard to get people to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it and what how it's done, basically. And I think that's an important point, but now I think this, this uh, framework has changed somewhat. Um, I noticed, let me see the questions. There are two questions. Jane, you have a, Marisol, there's a request for you to share the link for the 1,200 OERs that you mentioned. And Jane, apart from institutions, are there ground up initiatives to students? It sounds like there is a lot of ingenious work done by Nigerian youth. This one's for you, Jane. Did I get that? Yes, that's yours. Do you want me to read it again? Yes. Okay, apart from institutions, are there ground up initiatives, say students? It sounds like there's a lot of ingenious work done by Nigerian youth. Yes, uh, although we are still at the, we are still taking a baby step, but there are a lot of uh, uh, OER works and initiatives coming up. Like I said, my, my institution, has quite a bit of open educational resources. And we also try to focus on the massive open online courses. And through the, the collaborations and the institutional alliance, we've been able to collaborate with UNESCO, with the Commonwealth of Learning, specifically for, with the Retreda uh, Institute, one of the institutes of the Commonwealth of Learning to disseminate training in this area. So we, are, we, are, we have a lot of champions coming up now and a lot of uh, sizable amount of research in this area, which is very much needed. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody, uh, would any of the panelists like to add anything? No, then I would like to ask, um, I think I'd like to go back one step. We have a little bit of time. Three or, three or four minutes according to the schedule. And I'd like to ask Jihan if she would like to add anything more about some of the ways that in Egypt, these uh, some of the bottlenecks and innovations that have been presented have been overcome. Jihan, would you like to take the floor? Um, sure. Um, I mean, in Egypt, uh, a lot of um, the problems in terms of higher education is really related to um, when it comes to OER and when it comes to online learning is that, um, I mean, there are two different issues, but um, there is lack of awareness. Um, there's a great enthusiasm for MOOCs and open educational open courses, but uh, OER is a different story. There is lack of awareness there. There is definitely, the, there are a lot of problems with um, capacity issues uh, that um, 
that um, um, stu and centralization. So I mean, uh, teachers are, do not have uh, the, um, the freedom to just uh, choose any materials online and adapt them and use them in their classrooms, especially in public schools and public universities. Uh, these things are um, kind of for quality control or whatever you want to say. The, you, can, you have to, very similar to Tunisia, that it has to go through a process of uh, that, um, of quality control that certain materials are um, uh, kind of um, pass, pass the test of someone from the government. Um, and so this, this really minimizes, um, um, it's a totally different issue that has that beyond awareness that many teachers lack, many professors definitely lack, um, there is the issue of centralization. Um, of course, there is capacity building issues. Um, there is huge skepticism to any materials that that exist online and uh, OERs are mostly digital. There is a lot of skepticism there. Of course, the pandemic has really helped in, in changing that. So, uh, so for the longest of time, nobody could move forward with any form of online learning uh and the pandemic has changed that dramatically into acceptance and excitement so i think we are go definitely going to see a change in policy so higher education in, in egypt there is now um, um a requirement for every university in egypt to include forms of online learning uh what these forms are is is left up to the university but this is a huge shift and a promising shift um another area that will be a huge bottleneck that i don't think um uh we still have an answer for is the business model and the reward system so um so usually within the public universities uh professors depend on selling their own textbooks and that is a huge source of income for professors of changing that whole system into open educational resources or even online learning um, that is a huge barrier that needs to be dealt with uh, for it uh, to happen and for oers really to take root in higher education especially in the public system um, the conversation in the private system so far has been well our students pay and they can pay and there is no need for um, oers um, so so there are a number of issues that are very different from what i hear my colleagues talk about um, and uh, yes so uh, i uh, we are we were in a different place i think but um, i think the pandemic has had the most positive yes it uh, it exposed a lot of things that we have to deal with in terms of capacity building for professors in higher education content online content and the absence of policies um, and infrastructure issues that have caused a lot of inequality um, within different sectors of society, but it has also um, really changed political will, openness to other forms of education. So I think in that sense, the pandemic is a fantastic opportunity for our part of the world. Thank you very much, Jihan. Thank you. I think it's really interesting that you're bringing up some, uh, you know, there was always talk that, you know, publishers are making money off books, but in fact, it's not just publishers. It's copyright holders already. There's a, there's a, it's much more, it's much more complex than, uh, than it's, uh, than it, you would think. And I think it's interesting to see that everything has just come to the surface. It's as if, um, you know, there was a volcano and everything yes. just came to the top and we're looking at it and then it's everything is now much more mainstream and up and being discussed and understood because of necessity and yes. the, for the recommendation I, we did not plan to have a recommendation just two months before a pandemic <laughs> first time in a hundred years but as i told you recommendations are very rare and we had only 15 in this area since 1985 so 
you know, it was bound to happen somehow statistically, some sort of thing, but we didn't plan on this one. So, yes, um, definitely. Thank so you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Now we've had a really what we've done up until now, we've been going quite fast in this, uh, and we've looked at the first four areas of the recommendation. We've looked at capacity building, we've looked at quality assurance, multilingualism, inclusiveness, we've looked at policy, and we've looked at sustainability. Now we're going to look at them all together. Uh, we are going to be going to um, to discuss about the the um, different points um, that have to do with inter international cooperation around the recommendations. So around these points, of course, the UNESCO launched the OER Dynamic Coalition specifically for this discussion. But I will give the floor. I think uh, I'm not sure how you've organized yourselves. Neil, are you the first speaker? Okay, so I'll give the floor to Neil uh, Butcher from OER Africa, who will address this uh, this point. Neil, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, Zineb, and uh, it's been a fascinating conversation so far. So uh, great to hear all the points of view and to see the comments on the chat. Please do keep those coming through as we're talking, because we'll we'll keep uh, monitoring those and respond to comments and queries as they come in. Um, as Zineb indicated, the everything kind of gets pulled together with uh, the conversation about international cooperation. And I think some of the earlier comments that people have made really highlight, again, the importance of international cooperation. The, the COVID-19 pandemic has really, I think, illustrated very, very clearly just how important uh, international cooperation has become. So we obviously know that for managing pandemics, international cooperation is absolutely essential. Although I think we haven't necessarily been enormously successful all the time in that. Um, but I think we're also seeing that there's a growing range of problems that the world is facing um, that without international cooperation are simply not going to be solved. And all of them are critical to the education system, both in terms of what we think we need to be teaching students uh, at all the different levels of education uh, in order to prepare them for the, the world into which they're moving and for tackling the problems that we're facing. But I think also, incre also very importantly, uh, that they highlight the, the necessity for open knowledge networks, which is really what open licensing and OERs is all about. So, you know, a good example of that is managing the economic effects of the fourth industrial revolution, which we've seen accelerated by the COVID pandemic. Um, and this really calls for uh, responses that are above the level of the nation state. So um, that this cooperation is becoming increasingly important and open knowledge networks that facilitate legal sharing of resources and intellectual property are just critical to tackling those kinds of challenges. We've seen the plus side of that in terms of the speed with which we produced vaccines and the sharing of research made that possible in many respects. We've seen the downside of closed networks where that intellectual property gets caught up in proprietary systems and makes it harder, particularly for people in the developing world, to gain access to the technologies that are needed for success. And education systems really are critical to this. Um, as Zeneb's mentioned in the introductory remarks, and then again now, uh, the OER recommendation has a dedicated section that focuses on promoting and reinforcing uh, international cooperation. Obviously, it's an agreement or an instrument at, between nation states. So these are recommendations, they can't be enforced, but it does try to promote and stimulate cross-border collaboration and alliances, uh, facilitate regional and international funding mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a number of ways in which the recommendation is trying to create a framework for open knowledge networks in the area of education. Uh, and I think this is just so important at the moment. Um, Pleasingly, we have seen around the OER recommendation, and I think this group of people that is part of the, the panels uh, presenting to you today is illustrative of that, is that UNESCO launched this dynamic coalition, uh, and we have a broad membership representing all regions that's actually supporting implementation of the OER recommendation, and this is a really excellent example of good collaboration. There's also informal networks that sit around the dynamic coalition of organizations that come together to see how they can help with the process. And I think the more we do that kind of thing, the better. Uh, also, as a direct consequence of the OER recommendation, uh, UNESCO's Dakar office, uh, in partnership with Zenep, um, has been facilitating uh, an OER initiative in the Sahel region um, to grow OER activities in Francophone African countries. And this is a direct product of the OER recommendation. Uh, this kind of collaboration 
I think represents the true potential of OER because uh, resources in French are uh, OERs are, are less available in French than they are in, uh, for example, English. So collaboration between countries to stimulate the growth and development of OERs and then to share them across national borders, particularly in contexts like the Sahel region where governments have very limited resources and where there are acute uh, developmental challenges that require cost-effective educational solutions is a great example of good international collaboration. And, and then lastly, uh, another example flowing from some of UNESCO's work is around the ICT competence framework for teachers, where we've seen a cascading uh, initiative of individual countries producing uh, materials designed to uh, educate teachers around the use of ICT in the classroom. So it focuses very much on that issue of digital skills that we heard about a short while ago. Uh, and then we've seen that because those resources have been created under open licenses, it's been possible for other countries to pick up, take those resources, adapt them to national contexts and policy environments, and also, in fact, in many instances, to translate them into other languages. Um, and this has now led to interregional meetings where the different countries that are working on these projects individually are coming together. OER Commons, which um, Lisa heads up uh, as part of her work, actually has a dedicated hub for the ICT competence framework for teachers where resources are shared. And this again is a great example of how governments can collaborate with each other in informal networks that make it more cost effective to deliver solutions that are responding to the kinds of challenges that we are facing that are common across the world. Unfortunately, though, these kinds of examples tend to be quite few and far between, and the focus is very much still on either national or institutional efforts. And, and so with that in mind, we, we posed a few questions. I'm going to turn over to my panel colleagues to hear their thoughts first, and then we'd really love to open up to the group to hear your thoughts, because I think these questions pull together all the, the threads of the previous panels um, and, and those questions are, are in front of you. But um, before I do that, let me first hand over to my colleague Gaspar and then he'll hand over to Sanjaya just to get a few thoughts from them uh, in response to these uh, questions that are posed on the screen now. Great. Uh, thank you, Neil. Uh, and welcome also uh, and hello. A big hello also from my side. I hope that you can hear me well. Um, based also, and we discussed with Neil beforehand, um, based on these questions, and I am specifically now uh, targeting this big question, why international cooperation and collaboration is needed or growing also in importance for the field of open educational resources or education or open education and such. Uh, and I see here, um, if I'm looking in the, in, 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 in the framework of the sustainable development goals um, in order to, I don't know, strengthen, uh, strengthen the means and, and the implementation of a global partnership uh, for sustainable development, also in the field of education, especially in SDG4. I can, I don't know, see and identify probably four main uh, points why international collaboration in the field of open education and open educational resources is of such importance. Uh, first of all, we all know demogra demographics in the world have changed from after the Second World War, when in the 50s and 60s we could count probably more than a half, so 60% of the world's children living in the more developed part of the world. Nowadays, it's only 30 or something uh, percent, uh, and most of the children, so more than two thirds of the children working in, uh, I mean, living and growing up in, in the developing world. And here I can see that, that in, in, in resource constrained countries, uh, our school systems oftenly and, and uh, oftenly stretched beyond their capacities. And in this, in this means, I can say that open educational resources can, can play and do play an important role. And of course, uh, then uh, uh, more or less international collaboration with this developing world. The second point is that financing is usually not aligned uh, uh, with the needs. With the needs. I, I say that poorer countries, um, they have less time or a more difficult time 
to, to uh, raise revenue. And here I see also the importance and the need for international collaboration. The third point I have identified or I, I have uh, 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 identified is that we can see that there is a massive shortage of teachers, especially in the developing world. And here there is another need for international collaboration, uh, uh, which I see. And the, the last and not least point is that and on the field of education and, and, and of open education based on, especially if we, we see the pandemic, if we see climate changes, uh, etc. cetera, um, it's, I think, more or less normal that we have to see and, and when, we, when we recognize that schools were often and, and mostly shut down, uh, uh, shut down uh, in, in the time of the pandemic and that different ways of education needed to be, uh, to be invented like uh, uh, distance learning, etc. So here I see the four main points why international collaboration in the field of OER is, is of such importance. For this point being, I would hand over to you, Sanjaya. Thank you. Jaya, you may be on mute. Thank you, Gaspar. Thank you, Neil. Um, thanks, Jana, for this opportunity. Um, hello, everyone uh, from whoever, uh, wherever you are. Um, my, I'm going to talk about uh, international cooperation from the experience of commonwealth of learning and trying to address the questions um, that we have planned. Uh, for discussion with the uh, participants. So everyone is welcome to uh, share their views and additional thoughts. Um, Commonwealth of Learning has been very active in international collaboration and I'll just highlight a few examples. Uh, in um, the last couple of years, we have uh, developed several courses uh, through cooperation amongst um, uh, various institutions in the Commonwealth. And one particular example that I would like to highlight is the development of two courses, uh, two programs on diploma in mobile app development and certificate in web application development, where six open universities uh, in Asia and Africa uh, joined together. Um, uh, if, uh, in institution in Pakistan, India, Nigeria, Tanzania, Malaysia, and Sri Lanka to develop these courses. We have a, a platform uh, which is over 100 courses which are available for adoption, adoption by anyone. So uh, people can visit that uh, site to see what are the uh, courses available. Most of the courses are result of international collaboration in the Commonwealth. So I'm trying to give some good examples of how international collaboration has worked. Has worked, and as the pandemic struck, community learning started an international partnership for open uh, distance learning, which was basically around uh, uh, the use of OER. Today we have over 60 partners in that, and there are over 200 courses that are, are shared by the partner institutions. So the um, the the pandemic has done one thing that a lot of institutions have come forward to share uh, educational resources. Not necessarily everything are in OER, but at least people are getting access to those teaching and learning resources, which were probably not available uh, before. But uh, availability of those resources for people to get advantage uh, during this hard, uh, these hard times are very important and very useful. Um, we also started an international uh, initiative with a hashtag OER for COVID with OER Foundation, ICDE, um, uh, UNESCO, uh, World Bank and others, uh, OE Global, which is uh, also part of this uh, initiative. Um, and this was, this was very uh, significantly important because it highlighted certain um, inherent needs in the 
um, a need for OER in the early days of the of pandemic uh, around the world, not just in the Commonwealth. So uh, we had 79 uh, people from 79 countries participating in this international uh, consultation. And as a result of that, we also uh, offered several courses on um, OER copyright and licensing along with ICDE and OER uh, foundation. So important needs were, were highlighted. And uh, the important thing was to, uh, there are two critical elements, capacity of people to uh, uh, switch to online learning and use OER was uh, limited and that needed support. And, and, and most uh, important curated open educational resources were not available. Uh, finding OER has always been a challenge. So curation become an important part and a lot of curation activities were also taken um, care of, particularly in the, in the Pacific region, uh, where we currently run a big project in partnership with the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade in New Zealand, uh, University of South Pacific, uh, the the skills international and oer uh, foundation again uh, where we are offering a capacity building through a uh, number of uh, MOOCs uh, on online learning and oer uh, and digital skills per se, uh, for oer and particularly the focus has been around curation of open educational resources locally produced or locally uh, adapted for local uh, curriculum. So um, these are some of the good examples. Along with that, our focus has always been on uh, policy de policy development. Uh, we have this OER uh, uh, policy guidelines uh, uh, publication developed uh, with uh, UNESCO. This this publication is being heavily used in many countries for developing policies at national level and institutional uh, levels. Uh, recently, Call has also uh, uh, started a new platform called MicroCourse platform called CallCommons.org, and this platform has one of the courses uh, that is on uh, understanding open educational resources, which was originally developed uh, uh, with Neil Butcher, uh, and uh, this uh, course has now reached over thirteen thousand uh, participants, of which. Uh, more than 52% have successfully completed and have received uh, a certificate on the, the course. The platform has uh, currently five courses which are available for anyone to access. These are all open educational resources available on, under a CCBYSA license. So uh, the important thing uh, um, about all those things are uh, availability of um, support from the institution and from the partner institution, both in, in cash and in kind. And I want to allude to one point that Gaspar had identified about the uh, availability of adequate finances. And that's the most important part, boils down to both institutional and individual level, whether people are interested to uh, give their rights to a private publisher or they want to release on an OER. It's important to make people understand that um, the advantage of making open is far greater than the finances they receive or how do we compensate those individual efforts uh, to uh, bring them on board to make things OER, not just by mandating policies, but by providing incentive in terms of financial resources and in terms of uh, creating enabling uh, policies that will help people to use OER for their professional development or professional promotion in field, like research publications are counted, but OER work are not counted in educational institutions to a large extent. Uh, institutions also need to see that how do they can bring more funding to creation of knowledge content rather than from uh, the face-to-face -face teaching learning to turn into a resource-based learning environment. So uh, with that, I will stop here and uh, look for questions and comments that we can all address. Neil, are you going to continue? Thank you. So I'm, I'm just going to uh, put the, the, the questions we had up on the screen and, and invite any inputs um, 
from different people. Basically, what, what we were in wondering was about any examples that people have of ways in which international cooperation in the field of OERs is growing in importance um, and how you feel it can help to support the transformation of education systems around the world. I think you've heard from all the panelists some examples of how that can happen, but I'm sure there's lots of others. Um, then also, we'd be really interested to hear any questions or, or inputs about barriers and bottlenecks preventing greater international cooperation. Um, and do you feel that that's a problem that's getting worse or, or, get, or that's improving? Are the barriers more or, or less, uh, particularly in this um, kind of new international order in which we're living? Uh, are there other examples of good practice in international cooperation uh, that provide lessons from which we can learn? And, and then lastly, what, what else can we do um, to stimulate greater international co cooperation? Um, I think that would be we as, as the dynamic coalition, we as the participants in this panel, and obviously we as UNESCO as well. Um, th there's been one query just to get the ball rolling. Um, maybe, Gaspar, if you could say a little bit more uh, about the role of governments um, with respect to the recommendation and the national commissions to just uh, give people a sense as to what might be possible there. Uh, thanks, Neil. Uh, I, I would have raised my hand, uh, especially because of, of, of this question, uh, because probably not, not if I could talk now other examples, but I would like to highlight, and all of you or m most of you know that how much I do like and do support uh, the, the very idea of, of having uh, established such a dynamic coalition uh, for the implementation of the, of the recommendation. Uh, it was, I mean, to be also a little proud, I, an idea uh, from coming from Slovenia. And as you know, I am representing or I'm coming from the Slovenian National Commission for UNESCO. So here, this is a, a great example how a national commission, which is in most of the countries or, or, or in all countries, uh, which are established by, by the respective governments. So they are part of the government itself, but they are a somehow a bridge between the governments, UNESCO headquarters, and of course the field. So the field in this, in this case means the OER community or, or experts in, in this case. And, and as Mitya uh, uh, reflected before when he was talking, um, Zeynep, I don't know if you know that about, but, but there are first discussions that in case of the recommendation, UNESCO's recommendation on the ethics of AI, uh, also in this case, the, the SHS sector is, is thinking based on our, our proposal, is thinking in about something similar. Probably they will not name it dynamic coalition, but some, somehow else. Uh, but they, they, they also are looking forward to having such, such a, uh, you know, uh, follow up after the adoption of a recommendation, which will in this case happen in November this year. Uh, so um, here, I would, once again, as, as Neil asked, I mean, here's uh, the role of the national commissions and which I am highlighting from, from the very beginning, from the OER Congress and Ljubljana itself, etc. It's a way how, and, and we have seen in the OER uh, example, that national commissions can play a strong role how to uh, somehow, I don't know, um, motivate. Motivate also governments, but not only governments, also people from the field to work, to work for, for the implementation of such a recommendation. And, and this is, I, I, I think, a a big sign of success in, in, in the case of the OER recommendation. Thank you so much, Gaspar. Um, Sanjay, there's a question for you uh, asking whether adding open education work to something like the Declaration on Research Assessment might help incentivize teachers to contribute more actively. Uh, if so, the, the issue might be less about money and more about professional development. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with, familiar with Dora. Um, Sanjay, or do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely. The question was targeted at you. Um, no, Neil, thank you very much. That's one of my, uh, my uh, main area of work where I, I have been 
uh, promoting open access uh, ever since my UNESCO days. But it would be good to have something like that. But uh, DORA itself is not uh, really adopted in many Commonwealth or many uh, developing countries as such. Even, even though DORA talks about measurement of uh, research um, uh, should not be based on uh, the so-called indexes uh, that are proprietary in nature, um, but uh, the, the practice of assessing research based on uh, a particular impact factor um, is predominant. Um, so uh, it's, it's not that effective, though there are a lot of signatories to DORA as such. But what is important is that uh, professional development and recognizing people uh, for their OER work um, need to be part of policies that we work on at institutional level. And you need to work with people uh, to, to sensitize that it's important to share and there is more, greater benefit for, of sharing uh, of educational content than just um, uh, giving it uh, the rights to the publishers. There could be some advantage, but there are greater advantage for, for sharing uh, uh, the educational resources as open. So uh, that's the way uh, as, as an international community, we need to, uh, to focus. Uh, to streamline or mainstream OER in institution and to um, focus on sustainability um, from individual efforts um, and institutional efforts combined together. It's not just institutions who uh, need to fund, but individuals need to be convinced that OER brings value to, do, to them as individual as such. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Thank you very much. Yes, I was waiting to hear from Lisa. We can no longer hear the speaker. We were waiting to hear about experiences in the Spanish speaking world. Unfortunately, the speaker's sound is cutting out. Now, as part of the chair that coordinates the global open education movement in Latin, Latin America, every two years, we invite the community to come for two weeks to work on the issue of proposals and projects on open educational resources. We have organized three versions in 2015, 2017 and 2019 and this year we'll have the fourth meeting and around 120 to 130 academics, researchers, decision makers and students took part in these meetings and we worked together on international projects. I'd like to specifically mention the meeting of 2019 when the OER recommendations had just been approved. The speaker's sound is cutting out. The interpreter apologizes. Several actions have been taken, led by these communities. And these activities have been rolled out within their communities and it's really been marvelous to see what's come out of this open educational resources, open practices, all from this international experience. Another example we undertook with the laboratories in universities, for example, we worked with Guatemala with six university labs. And over 600 teachers work together in the field of open educational resources and their promotion. And this allowed us to disseminate the issue, which is an area of opportunity for knowledge generation. The third experience that I'd like to share we was an experience with UNESCO. We've been working on inclusive open education and we'll be working on 
the recommendations in the first webinar that we're holding. I'll share the link in the chat so that you can take part in this meeting. And as part of this international project, we created an instrument to see how we were doing in terms of the implementation of OER. And this will require expert validation and also validation of potential users. So this is something that we'll be making available to everyone. And lastly, I'd like to invite you to add to a graph that we've been creating with colleagues at UNESCO. The speaker's sound is cutting out. We've been working with the remote learning institutions in Latin America on the OER recommendations. It's a free journal that's available in Portuguese, Spanish and English. And I'll publish the link in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we're coming to the end of the, the Q&A session, but, um, but we, we've got one question which I'll pose to Gaspar and Sanjay as a way of wrapping up, which is just asking about how we might look at north-south issues, uh, where the OER provides a good uh, space to rethink or rediscuss international cooperation in terms of north-south. I saw uh, this question from Colin also had an accompanying chat observation saying that maybe the global north can learn from the south with respect to some of these cooperative initiatives. Um, before I, I give a quick last opportunity to my panelist colleagues to say a few words about that, uh, Lisa, I see your hand. So if you'd like to just um, make one or two quick observations, that would be great. Yeah, uh, thank you. Quick observation is that uh, what we're really seeing from a lot of these examples here are the, the bottom up and the top down importance in, in, in how we're going to, I think, move international collaboration forward. Meaning, uh, as somebody had said in the chat, we know the action is often at the ground level, right? It's, a, it's about the educators and the external stakeholders, the students, the parents, the teachers, uh, the workforce development and the career pathways folks. Um, there's, so that's the bottom up, but we need the top down, the support and the cover and the credibility and the legitimacy that governments give as well. We know this and a lot of the early efforts in OER, in fact, have been from the, at, at the ground level from the bottom up. So I think as we want to deliberately move forward uh, and how we expand international collaboration, how we really blend these two and make sure that they meet uh in the middle is something that we haven't done as deliberately i think as as we really need to so that's just an observation from listening to um the panel comments and the various examples and as well as our own experience here in the us thank you so much lisa so a, a quick last thought um let's start with you sanjaya just on on the issue of uh, north south collaboration and the role of oer in that then into you gasper and then we'll hand back to zenith uh, thanks, Neil. Uh, I, I think this is a, a very important point, and we need to realize that um, um, the, the, the divide in North-South in terms of OER is very little. Uh, in fact, uh, students in, in the North as well as South both face the challenges of not having access to good quality teaching and learning materials. Um, but what is important is the um, how do we connect people in north and south to work together um, on educational materials that can be useful for uh, students across you know, the, the, the various countries one of the biggest challenge of oer is is this because education are localized contextualized thing and it needs people to work uh, on their own context uh, but at the same time uh, they need to uh, work together internationally. So bringing people together is the only thing and international collaboration platforms like what is being done uh, 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 as, as uh, I think Gaspar will talk about that is an OER for better education, uh, uh, ed education and some of the work at Commonwealth of Learning um, uh, brings together people to develop con content which can be contextualized. One of the comment was also about the Pacific 
countries where we are bringing international materials to be contextualized for the local uh, institutions, local uh, things. So what is happening is that contents are being created for each of the nine countries where Commonwealth of Learning is working. So it's it's the challenge are same, but uh, in both North and South, we need to bring people together. Thank you, Sanjay. Kasper, you have one minute. Yes, so, uh, I, I can have less, thank you. Because Sanjay, I think- uh, Your voice is a little low, so. Sorry, can you hear me? That's better. Okay, uh, just half a minute, Neil, thank you. Um, I already sent a link to all in the in the chat um sanjaya reminded me and it's a great program which is called open education for a better world a great example um for international collaboration and cooperation also north south uh, it's a online mentoring program tuition free internationally which is run by the uh unesco chair on open educational resources in slovenia and uh, it's running already for the last, it has been running for the last four years. It collected uh, the cooperation of 40 countries from, from all over the world, from six continents. Uh, it um, contained already 215 projects and had 400 participants in the last four years. Please check out this, uh, this link because the program is successful and, and uh, it's uh, worth to, to share it. Thank you, Neil. Thank you so much. Um, and that concludes the, the panel discussion on international cooperation. So back to you, Zenith. Thank you very thank you very much, Neil. Thank you for handling that. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for for the uh, the comprehensive picture that you provided. We have done something absolutely never seen before. We're completely on time, which is amazing. Um, so I would like to first of all thank all the panelists and I would like to thank also the participants and I would like to say something which perhaps I should have said at the very beginning but I didn't say for a particular reason. All the panelists are members of the advisory board of the OER Dynamic Coalition and the reason I didn't bring it up at the beginning is because I think what's important is not that they are members of the advisory board but that they are incredible professionals each of them and in a very um, in a very large framework from different parts of the world, from different types of institutions, from different constituencies. And that is the point of the OER Dynamic Coalition, that it's actually bringing together all the different stakeholders, giving voice to every part of the world that we can possibly give voice to, and then sharing these experiences. It's not a neat little thing because the world is not very neat all the time, but what's important that it is that the communication and the sharing continues and the discussion continues and that we're able to work together. When, we, when, this, when this recommendation was launched, we had no idea what was in store for the world, for the recommendation. I mean, it, we just hoped for the best. But we launched the OER Dynamic Coalition the day that UNESCO locked down. Actually, it was every, some people were already on their way to a face-to-face -face meeting and we were told that it's never going to happen because we were actually all being sent home. But we managed anyway to launch this discussion. We were able to discuss, we were able to put together a roadmap that goes into looking at these four areas that we spoke about and then international cooperation in, in these four areas and the different projects. We just started it. We have to keep moving forwards. The big project for the next year is going to be about putting up a portal that will be able to share the different initiatives and be able to make this sharing much more interactive and much more um, faster and easier. We have the regular webinars to share experiences. We have focused work on each of the areas. And what's that's all very good and fine, but what's most important are all the different people working in the different parts of the world, in their institutions and moving everything forward. Only five, 10 years ago, OER was sort of something people talked about. We had advocacy. Now we're talking about implementation. The world has really moved forward. Our, the pandemic has been very unfortunate and has been, had a very catastrophic effects on a number of things that have nothing to do with just education, but everything else in the world. But we did move forward. It did. We did. We were able to seize a lot of um, 
a lot of uh, opportunities and while everyone was looking at online learning, OER was able to take a place in a significant place. And I do hope that, uh, sincerely, that we're able to do what that slide that I showed you just at the beginning was, that OER could be part of a sustainable future direction in learning worldwide. So with that, I would like to thank everybody who has been uh, all our panelists and all our participants for your time. I know everyone's very busy and there's a lot of, uh, you have a lot of demands on your time and this has been a two hour session and we greatly appreciate that you stayed with us and that you took part and you were part of these uh, discussions. And uh, I'd like to thank also OE, OE Global and of course Paul Stacy who just jumped up on the screen in the chat for, uh, for making this possible for us to provide this overview of the work of the OER Dynamic Coalition and uh, the voice to the advisory group members to share with uh, the group everything. And I wish you all a very safe and pleasant evening and rest of, your, of this wonderful conference. Thank you so much.